Okay, so let's uh, delve more into the strength of welds. So again, just a reminder of what we talked about when we're talking fillet welds. We are basing, if we're looking at this cross section of the weld here, uh, you know, the actual melt zone might be something like that. We are we are making a conservative assessment that the failure is going to be shear failure across this cro this line on the cross section, extending the entire effective length of the weld. So, so the size of that is going to be 0.707h. This is h. That's a value we can measure. We obviously can't measure that T directly. And for direct loads, we're basically assuming that they're carried evenly across the entire weld. Uh, so again, that's just uh, our, 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 our shear stress there is the force divided by that T times the length, the effective length that is. So if we're talking about versus yielding, again, the von Mises criteria is going to be uh, based upon uh, 0.577 of the yield strength of the weld uh, metal, uh, so the, the electrode yields. 0.5 if we're using Tresca, although, of course, oftentimes the failure criteria is actually going to be 0.3 SU uh, if we're designing to one of the uh, codes recommended by the which we call it um, um, American Welding Society. But again, yeah, here's a here's a an example kind of showing a bit more how we had this tapering down effect. So you know, it's a certain size for part of the length of the weld, and then when you get near the corners, it tapers down. Here's another example. Like that. So basically, we're assuming that we got full strength over this, you know, ah, come on, I don't, didn't want to move that. Full strength from, for this, this section here, no strength there. So, we subtract two times h if if we get that effect happening on either side. If we have a return to weld where it kind of curves around a little bit, then we're basically, uh, you know, if it curves around a little bit on one side, we only subtract the one h. If it does that on both sides, obviously, we do it on we 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 just uh, have l e is equal to l. Uh, so. Uh, needs to, it needs to go around enough, so it needs to go around at least two times h. It, not more than four times h. If we start getting four times h, then we really should be considering the length of the weld, including around the corner, and then just uh, subtract the uh, subtract the h on that end. You know, it's a, if we have something like this. There, I guess it'd look more. It'd look more like that. If we had something like this, then we might end up just using this length here. So, uh, yeah, we talked about direct loads. They're assumed to be carried equally uh, across the entire cross section. Uh, if we're trying to carry a bending load. That is not the case. So if we have uh, an in-plane loading situation, oh, did not mean to click that. If we have an in-plane loading situation where the load that is applied is offset from offset from the centroid of the weld, uh, but it's still in the same plane as the weld, uh, then we. Basically, this causes a twisting action, which causes torsional stress. And, you know, as a result, it's quite similar to cal calculations that you've already seen. Uh, so it's, we're going to have some sort of moment. That moment is going to be equal to this force applied and the distance between 
the force applied, and the centroid of the weld group. So that the, the moment calculation is done based upon the centroid of the weld group. The J is done based upon the centroid of the weld group. The R is done based upon the centroid of the weld group. So our calc R is fairly simple. Uh, uh, J obviously a bit more calc bit more complicated. So of course we first need to calculate the kind of the centroids, uh, and then of course uh, our J's are going to be the uh, we're going to you know for for each weld we need to calculate kind of their individual J's, which is just you know the the I X and the I Y combined. Uh, typically speaking, when we got this, uh, a term that includes the thickness squared, uh, we usually omit that uh, because it usually, um, <coughs> uh, we usually omit the thickness squared terms uh, because they are going to be so much smaller than the uh, than the terms that just have the one times thickness. Uh, because the, you know, the weld thickness is always going to be a lot, or is, t is generally going to be a lot smaller than the length of the, uh, of the weld. You know, if you have particularly short welds, uh, then you, you may need to, you may want to revisit that assumption. But, uh, yeah, you calculate your, go ahead and calculate your J's, uh, for you know, for each weld segment, and then of course apply your parallel axis theorem, and then add the, add all those up. So you saw you saw you saw that last uh, last semester. Uh, fortunately, there's fortunately we're not usually going to need to do that manually. Uh, typically speaking, what we can do is we can go ahead and uh, uh, use uh, use some pre-calculated uh, values here. So uh, this is from table uh, 9 and 1 in Shigley's. Um, and basically for particular weld geometries, it gives a, it tells us what our thread area is. Uh, so again, that can be used to calculate uh, the tau uh, prime directly. Also gives us the location of the centroid of the weld. And it gives us what we call the unit second uh, polar moment of area. So that's basically, uh, so that, that JU, uh, this JU is telling us that J is equal to T times JU. So you need to take these values and multiply them by t in order to get our uh, our j's. So you can multiply it by you know put t directly or you know 0.707 h j u gives us our j. And those are just kind of based upon the configuration of the of of the welds that you have. Keeping in mind that again yeah. When you're doing these measurements, you, you kind of need, you know, you need, you may need to lop off a bit of the size that you have based upon uh, the, if you don't have the effective length, uh, if you don't have returned welds or or welds all around, then uh, you may need to adjust the geometry uh, for that. So uh, essentially, what we are going to want to do is we want to be able to combine these stresses, but they're you know they're acting in different vectors here, right? So uh, the direct component, the tau prime, obviously acts directly in the direction of the force that's applied. Uh, the tau double prime, however, that's acting in a vector that is perpendicular from the vector between the centroid of the weld group to the point we're looking at. So if we're looking at this point here, that's acting in this, uh, 
that's acting in this direction here. If we were looking here, that would be acting in this direction here. And you want to be able to combine those together. Typically, you want to be able to combine, find, you know, figure out which spot they're going to be the worst and uh, add those together. You know, we're, we're, we're typically speaking not going to be worried about this bottom left corner or the top left corner because the vertical component of the stresses that are induced at those points cancel out uh, some of the vertical component of the stresses induced by the direct uh, load. So anyways, uh, we can calculate those based upon these formulas here just by instead of subbing in R, we sub in basically these, uh, uh, you know, the distances in the uh, distances in the x and y directions from the centroid. And if you're wondering about why the, you know, I've got the y bar here on this top one, I got the y bar here in that top one, that's because again that, you know, when we take, um, when you, uh, that's because of the difference between uh, uh, kind of the directionality that you that you get when you take cross products using different vectors. So again, this this moment here, this moment here, that's a moment. I guess I to define our axes. So we got x, got y in this direction, but z coming out here. So the moment is a moment about the z axis. So what we're doing here is we're taking the cross product of a, uh, a z ax sorry we're taking we're taking the cross product of uh, this moment that's about the z axis with the cross product of uh, sorry taking the taking the moment about the z axis taking the cross product here of its of uh, something in the y direction or something in their x direction. So, you know, basically the, the way the math works out is that those kind of, you know, those would switch the signs. Uh, so we need to basically kind of switch the signs in our, in our, in our formulas here. So for example, in, at this point here, uh, at the top right corner, uh, we have, uh, you know, the X component of that. So here with the the moment that we have the moment that we have is a clockwise moment so that's going to be a negative moment we multiply that times this y bar uh, sorry times the y bar value minus the y bar so the sorry my y bar value minus the y so here the y is larger than the y bar, so that's going to be a negative as well. Take those two, uh, take those two negative values, multiply them together, and we get a positive x direction of the uh, uh, shear stress induced there. So, and then of course the y component uh, is base. You know the the m. The M's here still remains negative times the X minus X bar. So in that case, that would be positive. And negative times positive means that we're causing stresses that go downwards. Generally speaking, that ha that all that having been said, I generally find it's usually easiest just to uh, just to figure out your directionality by inspection. So, you know, if you have a moment, you know, if your load's causing a torsional moment in this direction, you know that the stresses are going to be going that way, that way, that way, and that way. And then just, you know, by inspection, figure out what it is. The magnitude can be, uh, the magnitude is ju just based upon the, the magnitudes of those values. 
The other one that we have is bending stresses. So these are, are going to be an out of plane loading situation. So again, we got the weld that is in a particular plane. Uh, and then the force that's being applied is in a different plane. So again, it, it'll typically be uh, the component of the uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the the component of the f of the force that's causing the uh, this bending stress will be um, what you might call it. Uh, will be acting parallel to the plane of the weld. So again, we got our always going to have the uh, direct load and then we're going to have the tau uh, the tau triple prime so that'll be the moment times c times a so again c is just going to be the distance from the neutral axis and did i say a i meant i yeah whatever m c over i so c is going to be the distance from the neutral axis I is going to be again just based upon the based upon a cr the cross section kind of the weld. So again, for a weld shape like this, we're basically we're basically calculating the I for for a cross section that looks like this. So again, a lot of those are already calculated for us. Uh, we don't need to worry too much about that. So again, treat the welds as lines, calculate the unit I. We're given the geometries and then take, find your I by multiplying it by T. So here's a few geometries that we have. Uh, again, we're given the throat area, we're given the location of the centroid, we're given the unit second moment of area. So we take those those IUs and multiply it by T to get our, uh, our I's. Here's a few other geometries. Uh, so that is also in Shigley's. I think that's table uh, 9.2. I didn't... Uh, I forgot to include it. On, uh, I didn't include that at the top, but uh, I'm pretty sure it's 9.2. It's it's fairly fairly shortly after the uh, the torsional one. So then, uh, oh, um, one other thing. Uh, so again, if we have, if we see, if we're looking at this thing like this, then essentially. It, in order to resist that bending moment, we're going to have to be applying. Well, if it, if we're applying if we're applying a load like this that is causing bending moment, then basically you're going to have compressive forces induced at the bottom, and you're going to have tensile tensile forces at the top. We are not worried about the compressive forces. The compressive forces just mean that the thing that is welded to the, uh, you know, that, that is welded on is pressing directly into the uh, uh, kind of the, the parent body there. Uh, so, so the weld doesn't need to hold that. The weld is perfectly, you know, the, the weld is there to hold the two components together when something is trying to separate them. It's not, you know, if, it, if they're just pressing together, it's not, it doesn't have a job to do. If they're being pulled apart, it has a job to do. So down at the bottom here, we're not worried about what's going on there. We're worried about what's happening at the top where there's some sort of tensile force that needs to be, uh, imposed in order to attain that, in order to basically uh, prevent 
this bending moment from uh, from causing movement. But anyways, uh, so uh, depending upon the loading situation, you may get stresses. You know, you kind of may get x, y, and z components of the stresses. So just add them all together. Uh, break everything up, then add them all together using Pythagoras' theorem, and this will give you your total stress, your total shear stress uh, for the weld in general. So again, uh, a typical failure criteria that you want to be worrying about is uh, for fillet welds is that that stress there cannot be higher than 0 0.3 SU. That having been said, uh, that would be for a static load. Uh, we are still worried about fatigue. So Again, not too bad. Uh, we basically just need to do the same thing, you know, the same calculations. But we just do them for separately for the amplitude and the mean of our load. So again, if we have a particular load that is causing uh, a load that fluctuates, uh, that load is going to, uh, you know, if we break if we break up that fluctuating load into its amplitude component and its mean component, plug those values in for the you know what we did to calculate the tau prime, tau double prime, and tau pro to pro prime to give us a an actual tau, then that'll give us a tau amplitude and a tau mean, and then essentially. We can kind of treat it the same as if we had a pure torsional load on a shaft. Uh, so we need to figure out just what our SNS is. So our uh, our shear uh, fatigue strength, keeping everything in terms of shear. So basically, when we're doing our SNS calculation, what we need to do there is just you know use a CL of the point uh, 58. And then we want to be using that and we want to be plotting our Goodman graph in terms of SUS and SNS and SYS. And then our tau mean and our tau amplitude. So again, keeping in mind that typically speaking for steels, and again, this is also listed this information is listed in on table uh, 581 of uh, uh, juveniles as well. If you, if you don't, uh, uh, in order to call that, uh, but uh, for steels, uh, a typical value for the ultimate strength, the ultimate shear strength of the steel is 0.8 of the ultimate tensile strength. For other materials, they tend not to be quite a, they not tend not to perform quite as well as steel does in terms of shear, at least compared to its ultimate load. So for other materials, 0.7 SU is typically typically used. That is, of course, uh, if you don't have actual shear strength data for the material in question. If you have it, you might as well use it. That'd be great. And then, of course, for ductile materials, uh, we're we're look, yeah, we're we're looking at the point uh, five seven seven sy, and it gives us our yield in in uh, uh, in shear. If we're using the von Mises criteria, if you want to be a bit more conservative, you can just use half uh, for our Truscott criteria. And then essentially what we do is we just take our, uh, amp, you know, the stresses we calculate, the mean and the amplitude, and plug those into these two equations. Because again, uh, 
Uh, actually here. So now we're going to have SY, SY, we're going to have an SN, sorry, SYS, SYS. I didn't want to move that. I wanted to draw another thing. SNS, SUS. So again, this formula here corresponds to hitting uh, the SNS, SUS line first. So if our loading line looks like this, then this this will give us a lower value. If our loading line looks like this, then this uh, then uh, the bottom uh, formula will give us a lower value. So whichever has the lowest safety factor is the one that kind of uh, that uh, comes into play here. As for the KFs. These are the stress concentrations that we're going to be using. So, uh, based upon uh, kind of uh, the, the configuration of the weld. Uh, so if the, if we have loading that is parallel to the, uh, to the fillet weld, uh, then we use KF uh, 7.2. Sorry, 2.7. If we have transverse loading, so where the uh, loading is perpendicular to the fillet load, we're looking at 1.5. Uh, if we have a sharp cornered T weld with a tensile load, uh, it's a bit higher, uh, 2.0. That's basically kind of that's basically kind of just how uh, taking into account more so the interactions. Because we're going to get kind of a sharper stress flow for, you know, for holding this down and pulling up, we're going to get a sharper stress flow in the corners than if say there, than if say it was a, you know, a fatter, uh, a fatter uh, kind of uh, weld juncture. And then if we're looking at butt welds without the reinforcement ground flat. Uh, 1.2 is a reasonable value to use. If you do grind the reinforcements flat, so basically if you if you, if you grind this thing flat, 1.0. If, if you restore it to the original geometry, like, uh, sorry, not, not the original geometry, if you transform the weld into uh, you know, a flat surface, uh, then, then basically you're you're eliminating the stress concentrations that would have otherwise occurred. So we're we're not worried about that. So yeah, that is that, and we will do some examples uh, shortly. Not too complicated. It's uh, uh yeah.